Well, there we are, uh, hot off the press. Quite uh, literally, because it seems as though I've set myself on fire again. Um, and it's blowing right up in my face, and it was filling my welding helmet uh, with smoke. And uh, I'm actually not enjoying breathing that in, so I think I'm gonna take care of that, and then we'll uh, return to this shortly. Well, it has been requested that I do something with these 1944 inner front fender aprons and normally I'm all for fixing garbage but there's kind of a point where you gotta say like is it worth it um, yes I guess they could be saved the problem is is I don't have the truck here to fit them to so I would literally just be guessing and you can see this has been kinked here and it's bent here. I don't know what shape that's supposed to be. It's cracked down here, missing something here, missing pieces up here. The whole thing is just completely, this is just all gone, cracked, fatigued away, cracked here, bent up at the bottom. There's just, this side's even worse, just rusted away here. Look at that, all garbage, missing pieces. There's just nothing, nothing really salvageable here. So my solution here is I was able to track down another set of inner fender aprons that are largely intact. But unfortunately, someone has hacked them out to fit a Pinto front suspension, which isn't very good at all. So our solution, I guess, is to trim away what we can salvage from this and splice it in with this, something like that, and at least make a somewhat usable inner apron. Now, just a uh, statement here. I am not finishing this out super fancy or getting carried away with it. I'm just going to cut it, weld it in with the MIG, grind it, maybe a little bit of hammer and dolly if it needs it. But, you know, there's just, I mean, uh, we've already been on a pretty extensive idiot quest here and uh, we don't need to, you know, extend it any further. These are already stamped out of very thin metal compared to the exterior fenders and they're all full of uh, ripples and imperfections. Obviously the factory wasn't concerned. So, I mean, if you wanted to make them all absolutely perfect, um, I don't even think you could, but I mean, if you really wanted to, you could. But like how much time are you gonna spend on this? These are available uh, for I believe $300 for the pair US, which is about uh, $650, $700 Canadian by the time they get here. So even that, I would say it would almost be worth it just to get new ones rather than doing this. The problem is, is these have been out of stock for going on two and a half months now with no ETA whatsoever. And unless you've been living under a rock for the past couple of years, uh, no ETA means they are never going to exist again, or there's a very good chance that they will never exist again. Therefore, we have to do something with this in order to, I guess, keep the project rolling. Um, but again, you know, these are set the same as far as I know from truck to car, so they're not like completely unobtainium. So you have to kind of use our time wisely on this, but. Uh, I think what we're doing here is still uh, worthy of our time and certainly much more worthy of our time than trying to make anything out of that. That is just, that ain't happening, so. So I got this all clamped in uh, where I think it needs to be. It's kind of interesting, even though this was all, both of these panels were stamped in the same year, there's quite a bit of variation in the shape of the body lines and uh, what have you, just as the die is worn out or depending on what plant these are stamped at, so uh, you gotta kind of fiddle around with it a bit uh, as to be expected, but 
I have better luck with exterior panels are usually a lot more uh, close when you go to try and splice them together but um, anything like inner fenders and stuff they they weren't as concerned with you know quality control so now I'm just going to take a screwdriver and I'm going to scribe all around and then I'll trim this inner piece up to that line and it should fit in fairly well with the minimal adjustments. If you're made of money you could uh, use a scribe for this. You can see we've got a pretty defined line now that we can cut to and it's uh, totally accurate. It's, it's exactly the shape of that so as long as we uh, remember our tracing and cutting skills from kindergarten this uh, won't be much of an issue to get fit in here for a butt weld. So I got this uh, thing trimmed and uh, I got both of the welding surfaces clean to bare metal on both sides. Always want to get both sides as clean as you can. And if I was TIG welding this, I would want to get it fit up absolutely perfect, clamped in place exactly where it needs to be, and then start tacking it. But because uh, we're just going to be MIG welding this, uh, it's a little more forgiving and uh, we also kind of are under time constraints here where I'm not going to spend a week, you know, on this panel that you can buy for, uh, you know, reasonably cheap. So uh, I'm just going to start tack welding it in with a MIG and just kind of manipulating it as I go. I may have to take the zip disc and, you know, trim a little bit off as I go or do whatever I got to do. But uh, we're just going to kind of correct it on the fly here. I should mention that even with MIG, it makes your life a lot easier if you do get everything fit up perfectly before you start welding. Uh, this is probably not a, a great example to go off of, so uh, by all means, uh, spend your time getting stuff fit first. Uh, don't, uh, don't do it like this. But uh, I've uh, welded two or three things together now, so I'm feeling uh, fairly confident I can kind of make this work. As I go, we shall soon find out whether or not that's true. Now, I'm kind of uh, placing my initial tacks in a way that's going to get these uh, two body lines here lined up as close as I can get. These are the two most critical points here. Uh, in theory, you would want to start with the edge, but uh, like I said, because of the variances in manufacturing tolerances, the edges on this are uh, not exactly the same, and they're just a straight piece of metal, so they're very easy to manipulate. You also run into the same thing with aftermarket pad panels. The edges are usually rarely in the right spot. So when I'm doing aftermarket pad panels, I again try to get the body lines, because that's a lot harder to uh, correct if you get it wrong than uh, the edges. So. Uh, all the tacks are just being planned in a way that keeps the body lines somewhat where they're going to have to be.
So you can see we've got it uh, tack welded about every inch or half inch or so up to about here and then we just have a couple tacks here and the reason for that is I noticed as soon as I started fitting that uh, this here is narrower than this and not the same shape. Now this could be due to this damage here which we have yet to fix. I didn't want to fix that until I got this fit. So whatever is causing this you can see it's not you know lining up properly here and as I said you want to make sure that your body lines are in the right spot but that doesn't necessarily always mean just starting at the body lines because if we had started here it would have you know created more problems for us so instead what I've done is I made sure this was straight and then I went along and I tack welded it all the way up to here and then just did a couple auxiliary tacks here just to keep it from flopping around but I will what I'm gonna have to do to correct this is I'm gonna have to cut this tack this tack I'll try to leave this tack and then I'm gonna spread this over and hopefully get this to line back up again and see it's, it's lined up fairly well here and then it starts to get out of shape so uh, in order to bring this over, it's also probably going to cause this uh, to no longer, it's going to overlap slightly or whatever, so we'll have to take our zip kit disc and uh, recut through there. Again, this is all just, we're just doing this on the fly here. Uh, these are the kind of things that happen. Even as you're tack welding it, it'll shrink and pull together and do all kinds of stuff. So we just make it up as we go here. And Well, you can see here we've manipulated this body line into alignment here and it's now lining up both ways but because we stretch this over we now have this is overlapping here up to about here just as we said it would so uh, what I'm gonna have to do now is I'll just take my grinder slice along here at an angle so it doesn't leave quite as much of a gap it's still gonna leave a gap but that's just the way it's going to have to be as we tack it, it'll kind of pull together and we'll just make it work. But we did get this lined up, so this is obviously very critical here. And so uh, I'm just going to finish this up off camera. And once I get this tack welded in, uh, I'll grind down all the tacks. And then we'll come back and uh, we'll move on to the next step. So I got this all uh, tack welded together and then I ground down the tacks. The reason I do that is it just gives me an even playing field and a more consistent uh, weld as I'm going across and welding it up fully. So that's why we do that. Anyways, uh, I'm going to start welding this and uh, what you see me doing might be a little different than what you used to if you've been watching other videos and stuff. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to weld it and then uh, when I'm all done, I'm going to explain what I've done and why I'm doing it that way. So rather than explain later, I'm going to use the power of technology to just voice over this part and explain what I'm doing as I go. What's happening here is I am welding about a half inch at a time using the stitch weld technique. Then I am immediately grinding down that weld and then going right back into welding again another half inch at a time. Weld half inch at a time, grind it, weld half inch at a time, grind it. And just repeating that the whole way across the panel. I'm not uh, sitting around and uh, quenching the weld or trying to skip around or keep it cool or anything like that. I'm just going along and uh, this, I realize this kind of uh, goes against probably what most of you have been led to understand and certainly what I had originally understood as well. But uh, now the advantage of MIG welding is that it's a much cooler weld than other forms of welding. So, I mean, if you can keep the panel cool, then it's going to warp less. Uh, but the disadvantage of MIG weld is that 
it cools so fast that it actually ends up, you end up with a much harder weld than any other form of welding. And because that weld is so hard, it's very difficult to work it back into shape. Um, it's more brittle, it, it's more prone to cracking um, if it's overworked. So um, the theory here is that we're keeping the metal warm and allowing it to cool naturally, which is resulting in a slightly softer weld. And it's actually, I have found in my experimentation, it often results in the same amount or even less uh, distortion than if I had just taken my time and welded very slowly or skipped around as you traditionally would with a MIG. Um, so that's kind of the theory there. Now, I think still, you know, skipping around or welding slowly is still very valid. Uh, method of doing things. This is just a different way of doing it and something I've been experimenting with now for going on two years and I know people have accused me in the past of uh, posting nonsense or whatever. I don't care what they say, uh, the Louisiana lap weld and uh, fixing cracked fenders with uh, short hair and uh, branches is 100% valid. I don't post anything on here that uh, I haven't tested myself. So I've been testing this in all various situations and like I said, I have found that it is in fact a uh, very valid method of doing things. Obviously the advantage here is that it is uh, much faster and um, in some cases it results in less warpage. Now you're never going to get away from warpage 100% when you're welding. It always The metal will always shrink slightly after you're done welding. And so obviously the amount of heat you put in, the more heat you put in, the more it's going to shrink. But heating it, there's a difference between heating it past the yield point, which is what happens when you're welding, and just getting the metal warm. In this case, we're just keeping the metal warm as we're going, but we're never overheating it past that yield point once the initial welding is done. That is allowing the weld to remain more malleable, and I find that when we grind it right away, it's almost kind of shocking the metal and it's it's kind of preventing it from shrinking more than it would normally and creating that trough that you get uh, whenever you weld something. Now you don't want to just go to town and just weld one continuous pass with the MIG and then go back and grind it while it's still hot uh, because the problem with that is at that point, then you are going to be overheating the metal. You are going to warp it. And by the time you go back to where you started welding to grind it, that's already going to be cool. And it's already, once it's cool and it's been allowed to cool rapidly as a MIG weld normally would, then you're ending up with a very hard weld and you're going to have a real tough time trying to actually um, work that back out. Um, and at that point, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So it's not, it's not like a TIG weld where you can just weld one continuous pass and then go back and hammer and dolly it and have it all end up nice. It's very difficult to do that with a MIG. Not impossible, but very difficult. So this way, we are still controlling our heat just in a different way. And we're only doing a half inch at a time, which is allowing us and then grinding it while it's still hot and, and just keeping that metal warm, like I said, and uh, preventing it from cooling too fast and becoming brittle or, or warping more. So this isn't something that I have invented. Uh, it's something I read about about eight years ago. Originally I wrote it off because it, uh, as I'm sure it's doing for you, it kind of goes against all the traditional theories of, oh, you don't want to warp it or whatever. Like I said, it's going to warp no matter what, but uh, welding it slowly is kind of a an approved method and certainly valid still uh, obviously quite tedious but it does you know it's a good way of minimizing your warpage uh, this is just another way of doing it and I kind of wrote it off originally and then uh, when I started TIG welding I started to kind of understand um, the uh, advantage of just welding things and then what you know what a hotter weld and a uh, weld that cools slower the advantages of that and anyways, uh, about two years ago, I was watching Ray Shaleen, 
Uh, he's, uh, if you don't know who he is, he's a pretty serious metal shaper, coach builder, uh, does beautiful restoration work and like pretty serious guy. So he has a YouTube channel and he was mentioning on his YouTube channel about a friend of his who was using this technique. And just like me, he originally wrote it off and he hates MIG welding. I mean, he'll tell you that's for farm trucks or whatever. And I, I still think MIG welding has its place. Um, but anyways, uh, he started thinking about it and, you know, then he, he explained it basically as I'm explaining it to you uh, as to why it's actually valid. And, um, so as soon as I heard him, you know, kind of endorse it and it's like, well, if he says it's, you know, valid, then I need to try this out. So I've been experimenting with this now for two years on different projects, seeing how it reacts and what have you. And it now has my endorsement, which is why we're making a video about it. It's not the be all end all. There are still times when uh, you would want to take your time with MIG welding. It's just another uh, trick and way of doing things. So um, if I didn't have access to a panel, I might be less inclined to do it this way. I would be more inclined to take my time because if, as you see, I have had to go back and do a little bit of hammer and dolly as I'm welding this. And I have full access on this panel, but if I was welding something where I didn't have access and it started to get away from me, then I have no way of correcting it and you run the risk of making a mess. So um, that's kind of, it's something that I would encourage you to play around with as well, but uh, don't start on something that's critical. Start on, you know, small steps, see how it works for you. Maybe it won't work for you. It's been working for me quite well. So that's why I'm making this video and uh, you know, um, just just another way of doing things not uh, there's never just one set way of doing things um, Regardless of what some people will tell you Look on the back side. We've got full penetration all the way through the back. You know, we got nice little lumps and bumps here Which is what you want to see um, I'll go back and uh, dress these welds down after I'm done talking here but uh, you would also just leave them if uh, you so choose but uh, because this is visible from the, the inside um, through the wheel well, we'll clean it up a bit. So here's the finished thing all uh, installed in the fender there. And uh, all we've done since last time is we just sand it over with a dual action with 80 grit just to, uh, I guess, you know, do whatever with it. So that's as far as I'm taking it. I, I didn't uh, hammer and dolly it, didn't do anything else with it. It's just exactly as they say, hot off the press, so that's uh, that's all I'm doing there. Uh, there's no sense in, you know, we could keep going and get crazy with it, but, you know, we look at this inner fender, like I said, it, there's all kinds of imperfections in it, even right from factory, you know, you look at, like, this thing here, it's like the, the body line goes from rounded to sharp, just like halfway through, and that's just, that's just the way it was stamped, so, I mean, where, did, where does it end? Well, you know, there's going to be an engine here and everything else. So I think uh, for what I was trying to do here, this is uh, certainly going to be, uh, I guess, okay. At least uh, that's that's as far as I just I have to stop somewhere. Otherwise, you know, it just never ends. So um, as you can see, we did that, and uh, you know, definitely not perfect. But uh, you could argue that uh, we also haven't completely ruined it. Um, like I said, you know, people are understandably afraid of uh, putting too much heat into a panel. But uh, you can see by doing it the way that we did, uh, we were able to get away with it without ruining it. This is all pretty flat through here. And, uh, you know, there's no oil can or anything weird like that. Um, you know, there's always going to be some distortion and shrinking and warping and stuff. You want to try to keep it to a minimum, obviously, so this is just a different way of keeping it minimized while still, you know, doing things efficiently and uh, in a fast, faster manner. So you know, it's only, I guess, fair that uh, before we go, we show you these, uh, the rest of these fenders. And um, if uh, you've been following along on the channel, you know uh, what these looked like before. Um, but if you're new here, I'll just... Uh, edit in a little uh, clip of the before and
then you can kind of see what uh, we did. We did a couple videos on these fenders, but not a whole series. It was just impossible to uh, film all of it. But uh, I'll just give you an overview here of uh, where uh, where we've come, and uh, we're very pleased to say that uh, I'm finally uh, done my part on these. So they'll so be uh, leaving here now, I guess. Anyways, we'll start with uh, what was in fact the worst one. Uh, this one was quite badly damaged. Um, so we've done a fair amount of work. We replaced basically the bottom uh, all through here. And this whole headlight area was severely damaged. And in fact, this whole front section was severely damaged. Um, I mean, the whole fender was, but you know, there's cracks all through here. This area had a large um, amount of damage where somebody had, you know, gone at it with a claw hammer to try to fix it. So all that had to be smoothed out. Uh, we were missing a large section in here. That was all broken away and cracked. So we got that all fixed. And, you know, the whole fender was just uh, excessive damage. Now at the front here, uh, this was a similar situation. It had been in some kind of frontal collision and had severely damaged this whole headlight bucket and then someone had just beat it out with like an axe handle or a claw hammer or something or other just to get it usable again. These were obviously like farm truck fixed or whatever. So this thing, this vendor really fought me um, just to get this all back into shape. And if you can see here, it kind of shows up on camera, but I, I got it as far as I could and I just kept fighting with it and fighting with it and then I ended up uh you know the only real way to fix well the only way to save the metal underneath was I ended up going over the whole this whole front area is all lead here so that was a a whole project in and of itself you know um I definitely prefer not to use lead at all if I don't have to but in this case it was just the only way that this was going to get saved. Uh, not really practical to build this whole front section. Um, it, even, you know, this is a quite a complex shape. Um, if you look at the, these are truck fenders, but the passenger car fenders, the front is the same. If you look at those fenders, uh, they're available aftermarket and the new aftermarket ones is such a complex panel, even to, to stamp out the, that they've had to make them in two pieces. The new piece the new fenders so you can imagine just the amount of work i would have to do to make all of this from scratch with basic hand tools so uh, that wasn't happening and the other option obviously would have been to find another fender and cut the whole front off and then graft it onto this one and i actually did look at another set of fenders well i would have had to buy two fenders which i didn't need to begin with and the second thing is it was just as bad as this fender you know if somebody had already done body work on it which at that point you're just trading one mess for another mess so there was zero reason to do that and then you know i could have found a passenger fender possibly and use the front of that but then the amount of time you take trying to track down something like that and then you, you cut up a good fender to and, and you just end up with a fender built out of 300 pieces which isn't ideal either so we went with a lead on that, and that's just what it's going to have to be. That was a that was a, a bit of a nightmare, but uh, I'm kind of damaged in the head, so I did enjoy it, unfortunately. And uh, I'm probably going to be fixing more garbage in the future. In fact, I know I will. So uh, we have one of the rear fenders, I believe. These are going on a 40 Ford pickup, but I believe these rear fenders are actually off a uh, uh, 46 to, what would it, I guess 47, 46 or 47 truck. There's a few slight differences. Um, the 40 fenders, they have a hole there for the gas filler, and uh, there's also an indent with spare tire, which these fenders didn't have. And I believe the, the inner and possibly running board area is slightly different as well, but don't quote me on that. But anyways, they're going on a 44 now. So um, if you go back to the before, this 
fender was also quite badly damaged. Uh, there was a large crack all through here. This is all broken up, so put in a large patch there to take care of all that. And then there was just everything, every square inch of this was just beat. Down here, this was all broken up and torn up, so we welded in a new patch there and then finished out with some more lead. Um, same thing down here. Um, this was all broken up in this corner, which I think is pretty common on these. So I replaced, um, I think about from here all the way around here, somewhere like that. And there was, again, some uh, some pitting and stuff all along this bottom. But uh, it would be, uh, again, kind of idiotic to uh, replace metal just because it's pitted or whatever. And I had to weld up a bunch of holes here. Someone had drilled and it's pitted around the holes. So, I mean, I couldn't, like, finish them out really nicely uh, with all that pitting there. So, went over with lead. Same thing over here. Lead all this in. And uh, that's kind of what we did there. So that's uh, this one, both um, both fenders on the uh, the driver's side were quite poor, and all this as well was all broken up. So I had to make all this edge here and reweld all of this and, and uh, straighten it all out. There's lots of axe handle marks and stuff all over here. So pretty substantial amount of work there and uh, not really great uh, video content unfortunately there's just no way to I don't know of any way to make that interesting by filming it and uh, I did actually try filming a lot of the work on this and it was just me like 90% of it was just looking at my back because I was working here and working here and you know so uh, we just had to you know um, so I just ended up uh, throwing all that footage away. Uh, obviously, you don't need to look at my back for half an hour or whatever. So this one, we did do uh, several or two videos on this. And I think we did one video on this fender. So um, again, replace this whole bottom corner here. Uh, we fixed a large crack here bunch of cracks and things down here we had to replace a section here a section here and just again went over the whole thing but uh, overall this fender definitely was uh, one of the better ones of the uh, quintuplet or whatever the, the word is for four and uh, the final fender here which uh, I thought with the way things were going, this one was going to be more of a pain, but it actually ended up not being too bad. So, uh, this one, um, it had obviously some trauma all through here, which uh, had been roughed out uh, by whomever, and uh, it was actually reasonably close, but just needed to be fine tuned. So, uh, we spent a fair amount of time getting this all ironed out, um, and then through here. Like I said, I'm pretty sure these are 46 or 47 fenders and not 40 fenders, but either there was a big dent here or uh, someone had hammered in this to fit a spare tire possibly and then hammered it back out at some point with, with uh, some blunt objects. So we had to rework this whole area and get it all ironed out again. Again, it came back fairly well for what it was. So. We did that, and then uh, same deal down here. Uh, this was all kind of broken up, so we cleaned that up, uh, replaced a section of it, and then just leaded it in. Had to do a little more lead here. And again, this was all pretty uh, chewed up, so just a lot of straightening out there. And the back section of this one wasn't quite as bad, but I did have to replace a couple sections. And then again, the metal was just pitted, and someone had uh, MIG welded up the holes already on this side and again like uh, I guess if you wanted to like metal finish or, or whatever idiot term um, you'd have to basically remake this whole bottom all the way through here up through here through here that's like uh, 
that's pretty dumb. That's just, you know, at that point you're just wasting resources. So do the same thing here. I just went over the whole bottom, used the uh, lead on it, which uh, again, that's uh, still a fair amount of work in itself, but, and uh, not cheap either. Uh, the price of lead has gone up to 27 bucks a pound here. Uh, it was previously 18, which is pretty high, but uh, now it's absolutely ridiculous. So uh, it's just getting harder and harder to uh, fix this stuff, unfortunately. But um, these fenders are not available, so we don't have much choice. Uh, you fix it or you don't. Anyways, uh, that's uh, kind of where we've been for the past two months. As usual, these uh, projects, they uh, they take twice as long as you think they're going to. And with filming and everything, uh, it takes three times as long. And there wasn't a lot of interest in this project, so I just had to stop filming it. There's just, there's just no way um, to to keep going with this and make videos on this, you know, um, it's just not efficient to when this, when there's this much work involved to actually try to make it, break it down into stuff that you can film. Like I could have filmed every day and then put out a video every day, but it would have just been, you know, day 300 of me hammering on like an area of the fender. So, uh, not exactly YouTube, um, success story there so i just wanted to at least show the conclusion of these fenders the next video is going to be on the 1948 gmc i know a lot of you have been looking forward to that project and so have i so we're going to be doing a pretty extensive amount of work on that there is going to be a couple more uh probably lapses in videos going into the future i would like to go back to doing two videos a week. Uh, the channel was doing quite well um, before I had to stop to finish the, the 44 vendors. But, uh, you know, YouTube doing well, uh, still not enough to be uh, sustainable. So uh, there's a couple other projects I have to work on that aren't YouTube friendly um, in the future. And that's the way it's gonna have to be going forward. I would love to just work exclusively on projects for YouTube. That's kind of the goal eventually, but, uh, and I have lots of uh, projects that would make good content. It's just a matter of being able to uh, dedicate the time to that. And I don't want to just start putting out garbage videos, just, you know, for the sake of putting out videos, because as I, as I was working on these 40 vendors and as I was making videos, the last few videos, that I did on the channel, they weren't getting a lot of uh, audience, um, I guess, attention, or however YouTube puts it. They said there was there was basically less and less interest in the videos, and I, uh, there's kind of a fine line between keeping consistent videos and uh, keeping your audience interested. And you know, once your core audience you put out a couple bad videos and uh, it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths and then suddenly they're like, oh, he's, this guy's full of again, I don't want to watch him, you know. As soon as you scare people away, that's it. You know, it don't matter how many subscribers you have or whatever. You know, if you scare away your core audience, then that's it. So I don't want to, I'd really like to just make uh, interesting or useful content and not just the same stuff. And so, you know, the, 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 40 fender project. Um, the thing is, I could have, you know, welded up probably two rusty trucks in the time it took to fix them. It's just a very uh, tedious process that just doesn't. I haven't figured out a way to make that into content that's actually appealing, and I don't even know if there is a way to do it. But I'm sure there is, but I I just don't know how to do that yet. I mean, if you're working on a project that's uh, a linear, there's always going to be videos that don't do as well as others, but if the whole project as a whole is, has interest, then um, you can still sustain your audience and whatever. So these are the things that I think about. Um, I did really enjoy doing the 40 vendors and I enjoy doing work like that, but um, as soon as you start making, 
adding making videos into the equation it stops becoming enjoyable for me uh, videos um, they they seem like work uh, the 40 tenders even though they were they were a battle and a struggle and you know I hated it but at the same time I, I really enjoy doing that and um, it doesn't ever feel like work to me whereas actually sitting down and making videos feels like work but there's not at this point there's not enough of a payment uh, in return for that so I think what we're doing uh, has the potential to be successful and I have projects that uh, have the potential to draw in a larger audience and one of the projects I wanted to do or start on I'm not going to be able to get to until spring now because it's almost winter and I've got to start on that GMC so the defenders definitely uh, kind of uh, put us behind schedule to some extent which is I guess okay but uh, you know anything worth doing it, uh, it always takes time so this is just something we're going to have to kind of work through so again thank you to all of you for your patience and uh, hanging in there and uh, like I said I'm going to be filming as much of the uh, 48 GMC project as I can there's going to be a lot of, a lot of welding on that uh, as you can see, we've got this uh, 53 cab out, and it's going to play a part in the reconstruction of that GMC. Um, we've also got a whole bunch of parts for that GMC, so I, I really hope that video series does well. Um, it's more of a project than I would normally tackle, so it's going to be largely a project for YouTube, even though the goal at the end is to eventually sell it and hopefully make some of my money back on it. So. Um, how far I take it is going to be uh, directly related to how well videos do and uh, you know um, I can't force people to watch the videos so if they're not interested uh, people aren't interested you know that's entirely on me so I'm hoping it will draw interest um, you know I don't want to again like I said force people to watch any of this or people feel obligated to watch it I want people to watch because they they want to watch it because they're getting something out of it I know I've gotten a lot of great comments from people saying that they uh, my videos have helped them on their project somehow or or inspired them to take on a project which is is really what we're all about um, so that's really cool and uh, certainly something I want to keep doing the other big exciting news is that uh, we have reached 10,000 subscribers and we did reach 10,000 by the end of August and um, as I said I was going to give away a license plate if we reach 10,000 by the end of August and uh, you know I'm sure some of you probably thought that I was trying to get out of that um, and you know I may be a liar, a cheat, a thief, a hack and a flake and a murderer but uh, when I make an empty promise on my stupid YouTube channel I keep it in fact I don't just keep it but I make it even uh, even better uh, we're gonna sweeten the pot and I'm gonna give away two license plates now one license plate is going to be exclusively a patron only contest because the patrons have been a huge part in uh, motivating me to continue doing this and uh, so we're going to be giving away one license plate to our patrons and one to our regular viewers and so uh, for the patrons we have this Saskatchewan license plate uh, which came off my 1960 Apache and it comes complete with spider webs and an F which stands for freedom because our patrons have the freedom to watch all of my videos without any stupid ads so uh, this one's going to be a patron only giveaway if you're a patron and you don't want this for obvious reasons just send me a message and uh, you know I'll take your name out of the, the hat so to speak for the patrons um, I'll probably just put all your names um, in a, in a hat or whatever and we'll just do a drawing I'll just draw a name out of the hat um, on Patreon itself 
and um, we'll just do a special video just for you guys on that and uh, what you'll be walking away with this special prize so uh, yeah our regular YouTubers as I said uh, we're gonna be giving away this particular license plate which actually came off of this truck behind me here and uh, I've included a very special message on the back just for you the way that you enter into the contest is uh, you can leave a comment on uh, this video and uh, again if you, you don't want this make sure you say in your comment that you don't want it so we can save ourselves a bunch of time but if you do want this obviously leave a comment on the video and I will be randomly selecting one person who will be taking this away now uh, in my absence apparently there's a new scam on YouTube where uh, people will reply and pretend to be me and uh, well I don't think I'm big enough for that to happen but if it does happen if somebody replies to your comment and says that you won a prize uh, just ignore them report them or whatever uh, it's not me um, you know I, I don't know what telegram is or whatever I'll never do that um, so we we will be well I'm not too sure how I'm gonna pick the winner I think there's like something I can do to randomly select a comment but uh, what I'll do is on the next video uh, we'll do the uh, random selection of the uh, whoever wins and uh, whoever wins, uh, I'll put my an email in the video and you can send me an email and uh, claim the prize or whatever. So that's how that's going to work. Uh, again, if uh, somebody from Telegram or whatever or pretends to be me and says, replies to your comment, says you want something, uh, just ignore them, report it, delete it or whatever. It's not me. So I don't know, this is getting a bit long winded, but I have something that I really want to share with you in light of this momentous occasion of reaching 10,000 subscribers because I've been on a personal journey and it's quite a heartwarming story and I really want to share it with you to help inspire you and help you understand just how important all of this is to me and how much this means to me. So it all begins many years ago when I was born. I was born into a loving upper lower middle class family. Everything was going well but at the age of seven I was forced to leave school so that I could toil away in the coal mines of Tuck Yuck Yuck. I used to work all day for a dollar a day. But now, thanks to all of you, I earn a solid six to eight dollars a day from YouTube. Life wasn't easy during those early years, slaving away in those dusty coal mines. At night, old man Worthington would chain me to the bedpost so that I couldn't escape and find a better life. I would beg him for just one piece of coal so that I could keep the ramshackle shack that I was forced to live in at least somewhat warm. But it wasn't to be, and heaven forbid you stole any coal because that would be the end of you, for certain. This went on for a long, long time. Finally, I worked up the courage to escape. And escape I did, but it was a long, long journey filled with many trials and tribulations. I'll never forget my journey through the mountains of Saskatchewan. But I made it. I made it to where I am now, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And once I arrived, I realized that this world 
was cruel and that I was going to have to work very hard to achieve my dream of becoming a mildly successful YouTube channel with 10,000 subscribers. See, this is something I dreamed about ever since I was seven and that that passion, that desire is what allowed me to overcome the struggles that I faced in life. The challenges, the dust of the coal mine. And it was all worthwhile, I think. But even when I arrived to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, I faced more challenges. I became addicted to sniffing glue, something which I still struggle with to this day. But I'm proud of that. A few years ago, I was finally able to scrape together enough money to afford an internet connection, where I soon began to upload exhilarating and thought-provoking videos to YouTube. My dream was well on its way. It was a slow start, and finally, about 10 months ago, that dream it started to become true. I became monetized. And from there, it's only been up, up and up and up. And we finally, at the end of August, reached my lifetime goal of 10,000 subscribers. It means so much to me. You have no idea. I only hope that we can ma maintain this level of success and continue to earn these six to eight dollars a day from YouTube ad revenue. Anyways, thank you so much to all the patrons and subscribers and viewers and commenters and likers and sharers for allowing me to achieve this wonderful thing and make my dreams a reality and tune in next time we're going to be starting on the 1948 GMC. I hope you like projects that involve a lot of welding and uh, patching and life ruining things because that's what you're going to be watching for the next while. Take care and I'll see you soon. You're standing on Alan. It's not very nice. It's not very nice. Hey. You're crushing your brother.